Ladies and gentlemen and lady gentlemen and gentlemanly ladies, curtain up, light the lights. On this week's On the Rocks, Broadway comes to On the Rocks with members of the Jerry Herman Musical Celebration, You, I Like. Online theater with Playhouse Live with musical director Andy Einhorn from a million Broadway shows, including Bette Midler and Bernadette Peters. Hello, Dolly! Uh, Renee Fleming's Carousel. We also have Olivia Award winner and Spitfire, Leslie Margarita from Matilda and Dames at Sea. And we have Nicholas Christopher from Hamilton and Miss Saigon with my guest co-host, my producer, last-minute fill-in, Mr. Michael Vega, and me, your favorite host with the sassy most. Raise a glass and let the drinks begin. Thank you for being... Life is a banquet, and most poor suckers are starving to death. I'd like to propose a toast. This is On the Rocks with Alexander, where I drink with your favorite celebrities as we talk about fashion, entertainment, pop culture, reality TV, and, well, that's about it. So pop a cork, lean back, and raise a glass to On the Rocks. Fasten your seatbelts. It's going to be a bumpy night. Lord have mercy, buttons and bows and pantyhose. On the Rocks podcast, a place where we're too glam to give a damn. There are long lines everywhere. In line for the vaccine? Nope, in line for a pardon. Wah, wah, pardon me. Uh, like us on Twitter and Instagram at On The Rocks On Air. Visit and like our Facebook page and our YouTube channel with some fun On The Rocks behind the scenes shenanigans. Also, send me an email. Book me for a wedding, funeral, quinceanera, bris. I don't care. I will show up. Info at ontherocksradioshow.com. Send us your co- uh, questions, comments, and nudes if you're cute. Uh, <laughs> our presenting sponsors are Just For Fans uh, and the newest small business to hit the nation, fandaddies.com. Mm-hmm. Uh, where you can get a, a fan to fit every one of your needs. Just visit Just for Fans and Fandaddies.com for some COVID safe fabulosity. Kurt, do you have a pun for us? You're so punny. Yes, I do. Okay, make it snappy. We have Broadway people waiting. Did you know I had a uh, uh, crazy dream last night? I, I was swimming in an ocean of orange soda. Turns out it was just a fantasy. Is that like a Fanta joke? Yeah, exactly. Oh, fantasy. <laughs> fantasy. I mean, even I'm Latino and I won't drink Fanta. Fanta, Fanta, Fanta. Okay. Thank you, Kurt, for that thrilling uh, pun. Uh, the show is presented by Straw Hut Media. You can watch and or listen to our every over 236 episodes at ontherocksradioshow.com for free. Watch us on Apple TV, Roku, and Amazon Fire TV on the Out at Dot TV app. Share, subscribe, leave a comment, and leave your phone number. I'm single. Okay, let me introduce my guest co-host for the evening. Stepping in last minute, our uh, associate producer, Mr. Michael Vega. He is an actor. Um, he is an actor. I don't have your bio in front of me. Uh, no. Does it, does it really matter? He's an art collector and he's also our associate producer, and he's got a lot to say usually. Please welcome Michael Vega. Hey. One minute I'm on my couch, and the next minute I'm here in front of the microphone. How'd that happen? I don't know. Um, so we're, we're going to discuss uh, You I Like, which is uh, a new digital show. Um, in your whole extent, I know you've done tons of theater. Have you ever done something that's been filmed uh, for the camera, like a theater piece that just you just filmed? So... I have done things that that have been filmed, but mostly for archival reasons, right? Nothing that was specifically gonna going to air digitally. So yeah, I have been on stage knowing that there's a a camera somewhere, and I you know having to be aware of you know it, you know having to alter your the blocking and cheating towards like oh, it's over well, there. I know you're good at cheating. <clears throat> wow! <laughs> but when you film this for archival reasons, um, was there an audience there or was it just for the camera? just for? Yeah, because I mean, at, at that time, you know, back in the the 40s, the, uh, the sound quality and everything wasn't yeah, great. So the 1840s like, is what he's talking about, by the way. 17. He was doing Tartuffe. <laughs> Again, <laughs> um, but we're going to talk about you. I like because I had the opportunity to watch it. Uh, it's available on on uh, liveplayhouse.org, and it's interesting, you know, being such a big theater goer as as I am, and to see it kind of uh, digitally presented and filmed, you know, it has a whole different aesthetic to it, um, which I I actually loved because I'm like theater during COVID digitally, uh, musical, uh, you know, because we've all seen those uh, taped, you know, like you watch Into the Woods or you watch mm-hmm. Sunday in the Park. Of course, they were filmed like in the '80s, but it's still here's the proscenium and here's you know some different shots, but it it's lacking that kind of intimacy. And I'm I'm so thrilled to say that you I like has that intimacy um, where it's the full big show, but it's also that kind of cinematic 
kind of uh, relationship you have with the performers. Now, growing up on Broadway, because you and I have had our drunken show tune singing nights. Maybe, allegedly. <laughs> Your poor neighbors, by the way. <laughs> now, growing up, um, I was raised on My Fair Lady, Fit on the Roof, Carousel, Oklahoma. I was a latchkey kid, so the only music that we had were the records. We had records and records. Mm -hmm. And so when I would come home, that's all I would listen to. That's what I grew up as music number one. I wasn't listening to pop music. I was like, Madonna who? But it was all the classic Broadway. Your classic or your Broadway experience is it classical or is it is it like all all the new kids shit? No, oh, my shit. my first Stop. Sorry. <laughs> my first experience was you know it wasn't really at home, but I had an aunt who worked at McGraw Hill Publishing, and if you don't know McGraw Hill is above uh, Rockefeller Center, and yeah. so I would spend you know summer a week or so at a time, and she would take me to see shows. So I saw a chorus line and Chicago. Oh, wow. uh, one of my first uh, experiences, though, was uh, a play and not a musical. Well, I know that um, you do a, a lot of plays on yeah. your own. You don't necessarily do. Yeah, a lot I, of I, I can sing, but I, I, I always say I'm an actor who can sing if he has to. Um, like every <laughs> lead in Chicago today. <laughs> um, my aunt took me to see uh, The Odd Couple when Rita Moreno <gasps> and Sally Struthers was in it. <laughs> and that's when I knew I wanted to be an actor because... Actor, what is that? An I'm an actor. I'm an actor. You're auditioning for Andy Einhorn. Calm down, he's not casting right now. <laughs> I'm an actor. <laughs> Acting. Um, but the fact I was, I, I don't know, 11 or 12, and it, the fact that I was, I had never laughed so hard that tears were coming out of mm. my eyes. So it was something alien to me as, yeah. as, a, as a kid. And I was like, what is this? And it just, like, I'm getting a little chill right now mm -hmm. just thinking about it. Well, I feel so privileged being raised in, in a theater home. My mom mm. took me to see the shows. Um, I was doing improv classes. And my eighth grade graduation present, oh, I just aged myself, was seeing the original production of The Secret Garden. With the mm. original cast, it was fresh and the minute that the curtain rose and that dun dun, and then Rebecca Luker, God God rest her soul, uh, came down and, like you said, it's the chills and you can't mimic that feeling with anything else. You could go see a film on IMAX. You can, you know, anything like that. Nothing beats that that kind of feeling. Um, but I, but I'm a classic Broadway. It's funny when you said the Odd Couple because then whenever you tell somebody that, it's like oh Rita Moreno, it's like ah, and then and Sally Struthers. Oh, oh my <laughs> shit. Stop. Ah, she did. Okay. <laughs> Do you want to make more money? <laughs> All right. Um, as we said, musical theater during COVID? Are you crazy? Well, tonight we are going to chat with cast members of Pasadena's Playhouse, You I Like, a Jerry Herman musical celebration that is streaming on PlayhouseLive.org, filmed during COVID, by the way, bringing some much-needed Broadway positivity into our lives. Let's take a look at the trailer. Uh, I love that the best of times is now because guess what? Tomorrow morning, the oh, best of times is gosh. here. Um, I want to welcome the master behi mastermind behind this work, Mr. Andy Einhorn, a leading Broadway music director and conductor, uh, most recently served as a music supervisor and musical director for the Broadway production of Hello, Dolly, starring Bette Midler, and Carousel, starring Renee Fleming. His previous Broadway music directing and conducting credits include Holiday Inn, Woody Allen's Bullets Over Broadway, Cinderella, Brief Encounter, Sondheim on Sondheim. Um, other Broadway work includes Vita and the Light in the Piazza. In addition to Broadway, he has conducted symphonies all over the place, conducted Bette Midler and Mark Shaman at the Cat at the 2019 Academy Awards. He also mm -hmm. led a 55 piece orchestra at NBC Upfronts in a performance of John Williams' Olympic Fanfare, which is coincidentally how I wake up every morning, by the way. I'm like, you made it. <laughs> uh, and since 2011, Einhorn has served as music director and pianist for six time Tony Award winner Audra McDonald. And uh, he's on all of her recordings, one of which I listen to literally every morning for six years. I've listened to this same recording. Wow. Um, he's also music directed concerts for the late Barbara Cook. Um, we're going to talk about that. His tour work includes Sweeney Todd, Light in the Piazza, Mamma Mia, Sound of Music, and The Lion King. And his recording credits are many. Currently, he can be seen as the host of The Hook with Andy Einhorn on the Broadway On Demand platform. Please welcome Mr. Andy Einhorn. Hi. <laughs> oh, my God. Two of you are killing me. I am loving this. <laughs> Oh gosh. <laughs> okay, we're gonna we're gonna First get. Of all, you're so right. Tomorrow is the best of times. I just think oh, it's gosh. so. It it we're gonna we're gonna talk about that. But even just hearing that trailer, 
it's like a breath of fresh air and it's like here's a show tune you know and <laughs> it's a show tune the way that show tunes were supposed to be like fun and light but still say something you know i think a little contemporary broadway is like the, the more dramatic and bombastic we make it and the more mm. kind of introspective we make it and whoa, whoa, whoa. you know we're kind of missing missing the point of, of musical theater but i want to talk about you starting theater classes at age eight just just a little kid how did studying theater at such an early age prepare you not necessarily for professional life but for your kind of growing up into adulthood what what about theater classes did that that's so funny that you say that because actually I I was AJ and I started performing professionally as a kid right away because uh, I grew up in Houston and you know they had theater under the stars there yes. they had the Alley Theater Houston Grand Opera so I sort of was that bratty show kid that ended up <laughs> sort of growing up like inside musical theater right away and I just loved doing it but on at the same time I also started playing piano and so I remember coming home and going with my mother every day to the <laughs> local music store because I wanted the folio of every cast yes. album. Or, and, but the worst part was like, the, the vocal selections was never the version that you would get. Oh my God, it, Andy. You know, it was like never actually the show. So I remember we had a fax machine at the time when people used to have fax machines. And I'll never forget, like, I, I would fax MTI and Tams Whitmark and be like, um, I really need a perusal copy of this score so I could get the score version wow. that I wanted to play. And of course, now these are so many people that I work with on a daily basis. So Isn't that it's crazy? Really, it's almost like cringeworthy that I did that, but also very funny. <laughs> <laughs> I, I remember those days because my mom was a piano player, so she would go get music, and I would sit oh, there for hours that. and go through all the vocal selections and always be disappointed because you get home and be like, "Mom, play this," and she'd play it and be like, "No, that's not how it sounds." And it's like, well, that's that's Where's the music the dance break. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, mom was a piano player. She still is. Yeah, I did not know that. She's played you for many of my cabarets that. until she quit well, because I mean... it was too difficult to work with. <laughs> that is a true story, by the way. Um, and one of the one of the biggest uh, major purchases I made as a youth, I saved my money to buy the complete um, vocal and orchestra score for Sweeney Todd, and it was two hundred eighty-two dollars and sixty-three cents. I can still remember the price tag. Um, I still have it. Um, no, were okay, you? So my wait, this is such a random story. My partner mm -hmm. and I finally, you know, are like it's that end of the year clean out where you're just getting rid of yep, everything. Yep. And so we finally condensed all, both of our collections of musical theater, you know, CD after CD. And we got to Sweeney Todd and I was like, well, we can't throw out my Sweeney Todd because I was age 13. It was like literally a week before my bar mitzvah, I flew up to New York to do a reading of a movie that never happened. But in the cast, are you ready for this? Yes. Insane. In the cast was Phyllis Newman, uh, Joanna Merlin, Len Cariou, yes, Tom Hewitt, and Rebecca De Mornay. Oh my oh, God! And so what? I, I, I know it's like the weirdest thing. And Bogart directed it. Okay, like this, <laughs> so. Just put all those names in one place. And Len Cariou mailed me my uh, the original cast album I have of Sweeney Todd is from Len Cariou. Oh my God! And inside it is like this tiny little note scribbled out. I hope you enjoyed this as much as I enjoyed performing it. Oh Aww. my God. That's amazing. <laughs> I want to come to the Andy Einhorn Museum. Like I'm sure you have artifacts in, 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 your, in your house. Now, were you bullied for studying theater growing up, especially in growing up in Houston? Mm, no, but I was definitely that odd kid that was like, oh, he's going to grow up and do musicals yeah. for a living. In fact, I just had my, here, let's all age ourselves. I just had my 20 year high school reunion last oh, year. So we did God. our uh, reunion on Zoom. And of course, one of the girls gets on there and she's like, so did you end up just going into musicals? You know, it was like that and exact like, statement that I just said. So yeah, I mean, that was what I did. And thankfully I went to a high school that was, that had an amazing drama program. Yeah. I convinced my high school to do sideshow. Oh my God. Wow. wow. A high school did sideshow? Yes. It was like, not, it was How progressive. <laughs> Wow, that's uh. That's... But but like you, I grew up on the like the Rogers and the Hammerstein, yep. the Jerry Herman, the the Frank Lesser. Like that was the stuff. My parents had a, a vinyl collection as well, and you know, I just remember driving my piano teacher nuts because I'd bring in. I was like, 
Paul, here's my folio of the songs from My Fair Lady. I'd rather perform that. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I, I, I would study voice, um, and they would want me to keep doing opera. And I was like, can we do Your Good Man, Charlie Brown, this week? <laughs> I mean, like, like literally. Can, can I just say, I wish my 20-year high school reunion was on Zoom. Or <laughs> we even had it to do that. But I digress. Well, I'm going to say, do you want a bunch of you know older people trying to work out Zoom? Am I on? Can you see me? Oh, my. <laughs> that, that's like. Okay, well, I'll say the best part of, so on the premiere night of You I Like, I'll name drop, we uh, we had David Hyde Pierce yes. and Bernadette Peters. <gasps> Live. Signing, signing into the Zoom to do the interview. It was like, <laughs> no, Bernadette, no. <laughs> no, press that button. You know, and she's like, which button? You know, and David Hyde Pierce. He's like, I hate this technology. It's so funny. And, it, you know, we're all doing it. So it's like, you know, I just the, Bernadette the Peters. you get, the, the more obvious we become that we just don't know how to work any of it. And Bernadette looking so fabulous. I mean, this woman does not age, but I can say like, Andy, Literally. Andy, where's, I need her where's my Zoom? <laughs> so Andy, I, I need to know, you know, of all the composers you've conducted, which are so extensive from the good ones to, you know, some of the ones that sell tickets. Uh, <laughs> why Jerry Herman? because mm, he makes us feel good he makes us feel alive again mm. you know and one of the things when you think about when we did dolly in 17 that was right as this uh wonderful four years was beginning i can't believe it's been and, three years um yeah and i just remember this sort of collective sigh from the audience once they knew that they were there to have a good time again you know, like this this invitation that they were being given to a party that said, it's okay to laugh, it's okay to feel good, it's okay to celebrate humanity, it's okay to feel alive. And that's what I experienced every night of that show, um, you know, despite crazies. Uh, but, <laughs> you know, to do that show every night and watch the audience reaction, you knew that you were a part of something because yes, it was about the bet or the Bernadette or the Donna Murphy or and all of it. But at the end of the day, it was a celebration of life. And what I realized inside there coming out of that was it was going back to A, why we go to see theater, mm -hmm. but B, how we make people feel good again. Yeah. And that's what Jerry was, you know? I mean, if you look at all of his work, it speaks for itself, even, even a show like Mac and Mabel, I mean, she's like, you know, dying of drugs, but yeah. she's still singing about hope and optimism. <laughs> you know what? And, you know, what I love about uh, You I Like, it, it really celebrates the song and the focus is really on that. Mm -hmm. But then we get quotes from Jerry himself and we get quotes from people that have worked with him. We're talking about quotes from Angela Lansbury and we're talking, uh, I mean, it's such a great... Um, intersection of how people revered his music and exactly what you said. And the more I watched it, the more I just felt my stress go away. Mm. And to your point, it's it's such positivity that we need. You know, theater's supposed to make you escape and and enjoy. You feel, yeah, I you know I when I when I get the reactions of of people who've gone to shows uh, you know, before we were all closed down, who've gone to a uh, mainstream Broadway, and when they're when I say, hey, how was the show? And they reply with. Oh well, there was this big ship, and this was great, and 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 it, it's all about you know the the, the set pieces the, exactly, and or the stars that are <laughs> a little the... piece of me breaks, you know. I don't I don't say well uh, that's not what I want you to love, but okay. Yeah, but Michael, you're talking about something that's so evident in Jerry's work, especially, or mm. even you know Rogers and Hammerstein. It's like I'll never forget. I did this production of Sound of Music that toured the country yes. for a few years, mm -hmm. and um, we played LA in '15. And Jack O'Brien directed it. I saw you. It. You know, and that show is like it's a little bit of a boat. It's a boat show. I call it, like it yeah. sails into the harbor, and you're like, oh my god, is this thing ever going to end? Uh, <laughs> because it's a long first act. You yeah. know, Rogers and Hammerstein wrote like hour 25 first acts which is the length of, I mean, is six, even like 62 minutes. You know, it's like something like the shortest musical ever to open on Broadway or something. Um, you know, so I remember sitting there the first preview, we were in Boise, Idaho, where we had done our tech, which by the way, has the greatest coffee shop in America. If anybody goes, it's called Big City Coffee. I'm just oh. telling you, it's like literally the greatest. Um, and, uh, so we're sitting there that first preview and I remember on one side of me, I had somebody that was in probably in their seventies and on the other side of me, I had, you know, probably like a 
10 year old girl. And fascinating to watch the show from two very different perspectives. Mm. And, you know, we're getting the shows going on and then you get to the scene where, or the song that's not in the movie and, you know, you expect the audience to be asleep, but they were completely with you. And then you get to the end of the act where she's about to sing, you know, the original, the OG Defying Gravity, Climb yeah. Every Mountain. And, <laughs> you know, both sides, these people were completely transfixed by the show. And mm -hmm. I remember Ted Chapin, who runs Rogers and the Hammerstein organization, was there and I got to intermission. And I said to him, I was like, well, I think it still works. <laughs> you know, but it, it, was something, it was something about the show that I was like, wait, this still works. And I felt that same way in Dolly, you know, when, when people came on in uh, Put On Your Sunday Clothes, they're yeah. literally doing a costume parade and walking. Yeah. <laughs> at a quarter note beat, you know, nobody's doing cartwheels, flips, anything. And I thought, oh my God, why does this work? Because it's just simple and it's putting the emphasis on letting people listen and take in the whole effect without hitting you yeah. over the head with mm. it you know and i think we we oftentimes today i think some of our bravest mistakes are thinking that we have to make the spectacle bigger than what the writing of the show is you know like when you look at you know um katie huffman who did Love the producer katie. she katie did the she directed the the 92Y version of You I Like, because yeah. it began a year ago at the 92Y here in New York right. before we began pandemic. In and uh, February, Katie was right? in the original. Yes. It was almost like a year. For hell. <laughs> and uh, Katie was in the original production of La Caja Fall. And I remember just hearing her talk about that production. And, you know, so much of what she said about it was so true that it, you know, it was an entertainment. It wasn't a shock value piece, mm. but... It wasn't about the spectacle. It was literally the show opened with these people singing, we are what we are. And nobody had seen anything like that, but it wasn't, it wasn't a helicopter. It wasn't, mm -hmm. you know, it yeah. wasn't yeah. like any of that. Um, Andy, during during the show, uh, there's a, a really, uh, I don't want to say cute, because that's the wrong word, but there's a really uh, personable, intimate moment that you talk about your phone call with Jerry Herman. Um, and I want to know, what is something that you wanted to say to him that you didn't because either it wasn't appropriate at that time or it just would have been kind of ridiculous that looking back you're like i wish i could have been able to say this to him should we bleep um, yeah <laughs> are you in, are you into open relationships <laughs> So about those parties that I heard about, no. Um, I think what I wish I had asked him, but I, I was definitely too afraid to ask him because I would sort of always ask Don Piffin, who was his music director, I would always ask him the technical questions. I, I wanted to know how he was always able to, you know, there's 12 notes basically in the world, yeah. <laughs> but somehow he continually was able to spin them in a way that always seemed fresh and exciting and wholly original to that particular show, yet it still was Jerry Herman. Like, how did he achieve that? And I would ask, I wish I could ask the same question of Rogers and the Hammerstein, like mm. Richard Rogers. It's that same thing where it's like, it just is their DNA, yet they continually spin it. Mm -hmm. you, you know, my, my conversations with him always tended to be more about like how he approached his music which to me was so interesting because it was this directness that we were talking about earlier yeah. it's like it was boom here's how the song goes you know the back phrasing no thank you right. sing the sing the song the way it's written and it's gonna do it exactly for you but guess what it's gonna bring out who you are as an individual person because of that hmm. and that's what we celebrate about it that's a really good point. You know, his notes are clean and to sing, to perform it well, you have to do it cleanly. S same thing with Sondheim, you know, um, Sondheim, you can't, you know, add modern inflections. It, it just, it kind of ruins it. That's a really good point. It has to be clean and succinct, mm. which I love. You know, I hate when singers are like improvising and boobopping all over the place. It's like, that. that's <laughs> I'll not... never forget years ago, um, this performer still works, so I'm not going to say it, um, but... I remember writing on an audition sheet once, doesn't sing a single note on the page. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, one of the things that's really interesting, this is also tales out of school, but like when Bette was doing Dolly, you know, there's this innate freedom that has always been around with Dolly. You know, you look at 
Carol, the Pearl Daily, to you know everybody who's inhabited that role, and they always have a way of making it their own. And I always found it really enjoyable hearing what Bet would do with the score. Yes. Like there was there was always a freshness to it that it was still Jerry Herman, but with that mm-hmm. extra flair of Bet in there. And I was raised on the Bet from the Rose from her. <laughs> uh, Live from Cleveland, which is one of the best albums she's ever done. I mean, I listen to it incessantly, and there's that raw kind of energy that she brings where she is all over the stage. And it was so funny to see her play this role. And, you know, she did Broadway. She was in Fiddler on the Roof when, when she was younger. But it was so different to see this. And what I loved about her being in, in the role, because I'm not really into celebrity casting. I'm, I'm just I'm, Hollywood c- celebrity casting. But what it did, we all know how uh, Hello, Dolly is a well-established musical. But for the younger generation that grew up on Rent, they're like, I'm I'm going to go see Bet in the show. And then they come away and they're like, wow, Hello, Dolly's a great show. I need to get the original album. I need to watch the movie, which Gene Kelly directed, by the way. Yes. Oh, oh, uh, we had Gene Kelly's uh, last wife in on the show, and she brought his white converse that he wore every single day to set while directing Hello, Dolly. So he and uh, Kamala Harris have the same shoe. That, there you go. <laughs> He was the OG. Um, so Andy, what, what another thing that I really appreciated was was the kind of diverse cast of you. I like being the mastermind behind this. Were you part of the casting? What was your vision uh, for this group that you brought together? Yes, it was all my vision. Um, no, I mean, <laughs> listen. I think the universality of what Jerry wrote means that anybody can do it. I love that. And to me, what I loved was. I wanted to find five people who you wouldn't necessarily associate with Jerry Herman's music and really let people listen to what's there on the page uh, because it it does come alive. And, you know, it was very funny working with Ashley, who I've known forever, and she sings before the parade passed by and, you know, we're going through it the first time. And I was like, don't be so careful. You know, I want to hear what Ashley does with before the parade passes by. And then suddenly, you know, we, by the way, we were like rehearsing in my hotel room in Pasadena doing the early rehearsals. And she's like, on the other side of the room, you yeah. know, we're all masked up. And suddenly I'm like, hotel security is going to come knocking <laughs> once they heard, once I unleashed her. Uh, same with somebody like Nick. I mean, I called Nick because he was referred to me by a few friends of mine. Uh, and uh, I said to him, I was like, I don't know. Like, how do you feel about doing this material? And he was like, well, actually, I just introduced my fiance to Hello, Dolly, the, like two weeks ago. So it's so funny that you called. And I love this music. And I, I love his works. And, and also just watching the others, like sort of this infectious spirit that came alive when the others saw what each other were doing. Yeah. And they were like, wait, I want to do that song. I want to do that song. You know, and then reimagining it and so uh, what I think ended up happening was this sort of um ecumenical meeting of these talents coming together to sing this material and 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 embrace it and like they're all like can I put that in my book now um (laughs) spoken like true actors I love it and but it but it's real and it and you know what's so crazy as as we're talking about it and in these moments is I, I'm so aware of how alive this music feels right now exactly in this moment and uh, it's so important to me to introduce this music to so many people and to have people like Nick and Ashley performing this may this please be opening of a door for people to realize that this music is out there for anybody to sing it. That's exactly right. And what I really appreciate is the cast. You know, you, you look at their credits and you have Rent, Miss Saigon, Hamilton, and it's it doesn't... You know, how many uh, musical celebration shows have we seen? And it's hearing the same kind of voices singing the same kind mm-hmm. of music. So Rodgers and Hammerstein, you have everybody that's done Carousel a hundred million times, yeah. and it always has that same kind of energy. And while it's great, and it's a great you know homage to classic Broadway, you, I like, really um, captured this unique combination of the modern energy that we're mm-hmm. feeling and the modern way to perform some really intimate moments. We're gonna talk with Nick a little bit later on. Um, yeah. he- I love that you said, uh, don't, don't be so careful. Please. Yeah. Why be careful? Because at the end of the day, and I think this is the danger for young performers. And it's something that like, when I go out with Audra, I always like find whatever universities in that town. I'm like, please let me come do a master class. Because to me, there's this, 
realness that comes mm -hmm. when you're not afraid of what's there on the page. When you take it, you internalize it and you make it there for you. And it's not careful, but it's, but it's communicative. I mean, isn't our job to like step over the footlights or, you know, in some productions now they don't have a stage anymore. You're in a black box or whatever, yeah. um, like Hades town or yeah. <laughs> in <recent laughs> Oklahoma, but you know, but there's this sense, uh, of how to make music important because I mean, it's so elementary, this is so dumb, but it's like music and singing come at a point in a show where you can't say it with words anymore. So you elevate it and you go into music. Yeah. So why are you going to shy away from it? <laughs> the point is to lean into it and to make it special and direct and obvious. And that was the thing with each of these, I call them kids. Um, but the kids in you, I like, it was like giving them the invitation to feel free to make big choices yeah because right you've they've and, already done the work they're already you know but it's funny because it's not like it's all over the place at the end of the day it's essentially jerry herman and like you said it's it's clean performances and so that is. that combination is is quite thrilling and so i mean you have to go to uh playhouse live.org and, and watch it um but I'll and i i just want to throw out like mark sigler you you mentioned how beautifully it's shot yeah. and Mark Sigler is a creative genius. Like I brought this program to him because Danny connected us and I was like, I don't know. You know, I know what this is what we did at the Y and he was just with me every step of the way because I would describe what I wanted and he could articulate it so well how it was going to end up capturing on screen. And my biggest fear all along was these are big songs. Like how do you capture the space of a before the parade passes by in an empty theater? Mm. But he did it. I mean, I was watching it excited in my seat. I sang along. Um, I felt that energy that you would feel in, in the theater. So, Andy, you you had done the show before. This is you are the uh, you you conceive this. You put it together. But what did you learn about yourself personally from doing this as a filmed performance over a live performance? This whole process. What did you walk away personally uh, learning or experiencing? Well, for me, it was actually an extension of what Jerry talks about, which is a sort of a second chance at something. Mm. And so rarely as an artist, are you ever allowed to come back and revisit a piece that you've done? Um, you know, if you're conducting a run of a show on Broadway for 300 shows and then you leave, you're like, bye, please never again. <laughs> um, you know, but, but so rare, so often we put together like these Monday night benefits or throw together a concert in six days and you do it three times and then you never see it again. And you think, oh, that tree is dying on my shelf over there or, you know, just scan it into the computer and then yep. never hear from it again. So when I had this moment to come back to this, I went, oh my gosh, I'm going to take this. And so... The chance to collaborate with Danny Feldman at the Playhouse, as well as new performers engaged in this version, or as well as with Mark, it really forced me to look at the piece again and say, how do you take something that's meant to be in front of 700 people, but bring it to people's living room? And I'm going to shout out to this talent that not many people have heard of her. She only has six Tonys, but, you know, occasionally <laughs> she does sing occasionally. Um, this Audra McDonald person that I've been working with for a few years, you know, I've been asking her to get voice lessons, but <laughs> um, Who? you know, Who? Uh, yes, exactly. So Audra has this kinetic ability when you're in a concert with her where, or in a show where it feels like she's only talking to you. And so that was my goal here is like when the camera was on me talking to people, bringing that intimacy to everybody that makes them feel at home that it's okay to be sitting in your pajamas, drinking a martini, yeah. listening to Jerry Herman songs. And at 10 in the morning. Okay <laughs> with the world. Yes, exactly. So, you know, that for me was the biggest lesson is like be okay with making smaller choices. I mean, I think in theater we're so used to, Ma, you know, yeah, big, yeah. big, big. And everything here just felt okay to me to just make sure that it was honest and natural because that's what Jerry, that's what he wrote. It was always honest and natural and I wanted to fulfill that in doing this. Part of the joy I, I saw in uh, You I Like is not only do we um, get to see your masterful piano playing, most times you're not even looking at the keyboard, you're just, you're just <laughs> in the moment, which is such a joy, but we actually get to see you uh, perform alongside the cast. Um, I want to take a little a sneak peek at uh, the title song uh, starring Mr. Andy Einhorn uh, with his <laughs> cast. Let's take a look. 
you I like, so let me tip my hat in your path. I spread a welcome mat. You I like, can you imagine that? Although your ways may be strange, and there's much that I change somehow. You I like and warmly recommend. From now on, we call each other friend. I'll be at your side until the end. Can you believe that I found such a thrill in the sound of the new chord we strike? You, I like. You, I like. So let me tip my hat. In your path, my spread a welcome mat. You, I like, can you imagine that although your ways may be strange and there's much that I change somehow? You, I like, you, so I like, me tip so my hat, let me tip my hat, in your path, in your I path, spread a welcome I mat. Spread a welcome mat. You. <laughs> that was, uh, that was just a little scary. God. Yeah, because... God. Just, you know, just, just nice gentle cut. Um, because you have to go to playhouselive.org and you, yeah. you have to watch the show. Plus, there's a number of other shows you can see um, as well. So I have to know, you know, I, I always like to, to know the nitty gritty behind the scenes. You worked with so many big names in the biz. Um, who was the first big name that you worked with that you're like, what? Like, I've made it. This is who I'm working with. Who, who was that? Who was that star? Hmm. It was Audra. Yeah. Uh, it was 2006. I got a call. Uh, it was so random. Uh, I had, let's see, I had just graduated in 2004 from college. And because of my ties to Houston, she was premiering two operas in Houston. And a professor of mine from Rice called me and said, there's this woman, she's coming to Houston Grand Opera and you know, you're living in New York and you also live in Houston and you know, would you want to coach this woman? <laughs> and I was 24 and I was like, coach Audra, sure. So, you know, flash forward to your high C's a little flat, you know, and I just, but I remember meeting her the first day and I, I said, oh, it's very nice to meet you. And she said, don't tell me what's good. Just tell me how to make it better. And I was like, oh, we'll get along just fine. <laughs> Cut to years later, you're flat. <laughs> you, know? you know, Andy, this is literally my next question. How do you tell a major name in Broadway that they're a little flat or lagging behind or their interpretation is not quite quite there? How does one God, tell you, it to Barbara you sound Cook? Like the question, wait, you sound like the question that Bet asked me. What if I'm doing something you don't like? How are you going to tell me? <laughs> I said... Darling, very delicately, but you'll you won't even notice that it hurts. <laughs> you <know? laughs> but you know, it's to me, it always comes from the place of saying, I mean, look, with Audra, we've been doing certain songs, you know, for three thousand years, and I I sort of always look at music as this very elastic thing, you know. And again, that's another joy of coming back to you. I like was finding new, more nuances in the scores that I didn't even know existed from the first time uh, that I did it. And, I, I, you know, within that elasticity in music, I feel like there's parameters that you can go to. And uh, your job as a music director, I often believe, is how, what are those boundaries there? And for me with Bet, you know, or Audra or somebody like Barbara Cook is like, it's the nightly sort of judging of, okay, was that within the parameters or are we pulling a little too far out? Because the joy of the shows that I've been able to do, thankfully, have always had large orchestras and don't rely on a click track. So that means they live and they breathe. But within that living and breathing, you're allowed to have that sense of how far can we go. Andy, with your extensive resume, what what is your favorite moment or what sticks out the most? And it could be like a like a like a bad moment, but what is a moment that really sticks out in your whole career? And it's such um I, I don't know, knowing that you study this for, as such a young kid and you were seeing these shows and aspiration was to be on Broadway, now to see your scope of work, the people you've worked with, the projects you've done, and now with you I like, um, what moment really sticks out for you? Uh, from from this career. You're going to laugh when I say it, but it was the invited dress rehearsal of Dolly. And mm. I remember I said to the cast on the first day of rehearsal, I said, 
okay, we all know that the first preview is going to be insane. I said, but I don't think we're all actually prepared for it's the night before when we have an invited dress and you have people coming to see this event that we're about to do. And I remember the house, it was also, we had this blizzard in New York City. So nobody knew whether it was actually gonna happen. And all, all of our friends that actually had tickets to that were texting furiously like, is it still on? Is it still on? <laughs> you know, and they had, they had put the whole company up in yeah. hotels right around oh, the wow. theater because oh, they were like, we are doing this no matter what. <laughs> and we did it. And I'll never forget that feeling of the lights coming down and the scream as the overture started. Yeah. And <laughs> in that moment, it was that. And the other moment that I had that same feeling was um, on opening night of Cinderella on Broadway because mm. it was the last original Rodgers and Hammerstein musical that was ever gonna open on Broadway. And I just remember taking in those seminal moments of realizing that, of being a part of something that you join the theatrical community because you wanna be a part of the parade. You, you wanna be a part of that community. And when you get that opportunity to do it, you're you're so overwhelmed by it and i'll never forget uh one of my orchestra musicians wrote me an email late that night and she was like i've never seen such a smile on somebody's face and she was like you were alive well you're always smiling by the you way know? like i want i want to see andy on like a bad mood day i want to like know who that no, is no you don't <laughs> <laughs> he's like we're gonna listen to andrew Lloyd weber today <laughs> <laughs> oh Barbara! Oh. oh my God! Andy, I literally have I two two more pages so of questions uh, for you. Just real fast. I I'm always nosy. What kind of music are you listening around the house? Like when you wake up and you're just like around. Like what are you pressing play on? Like nobody would know that I listen to like Metallica and Marilyn Manson. You do not. And French pop. That's do what. That's really? my go. I love it. That's my go to. What What is Andy that's listening so to? For me, it's either jazz or old film scores. Oh, please. okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I, I'm always listening to new orchestration ideas. Mm. Um, and um, my partner has an amazing eclectic musical taste. And uh, I just love when he's cooking. I'm like, what is that? You know, and so he introduced me to great new young singers. But for me, it's really going back to like, the Bernard Herman, all of that stuff that, you know, I'm just like sort of obsessed with old scores that way. <laughs> well, things I'm obsessed with um, is our next guest. And Andy, you're going you're to uh -oh. hang out a little bit because I have to uh -oh. hear this story about how you met. Like, I need to hear this story. <laughs> so I, I want to welcome to the show um, Leslie Margarita, an Olivier Award winner for her West End debut as Inez in Zorro the Musical. Um, she made her Broadway debut originating the role of Mrs. Wormwood in Matilda the Musical after over one thousand performances she bid farewell to the broadway company matilda and crossed the street to the helen hayes to star as the diva mona kent in broadway's dames at sea one of the most graffitied posters in broadway history by the way uh, she later returned to <laughs> matilda and closed out its broadway run off broadway she started as princess in emoji land and cindy lou who in a one-woman tour de force who's holiday uh which garnered a drama desk nomination for outstanding solo performance among many other accolades she has multiple tv and film appearances as well as played all of your favorite Favorite roles in regional theater. She is the creator star of Looks Not Books and Ship Happens, the popular backstage vlogs commissioned by Broadway.com, as well as the digital short series Sparkle Puff, all of which you can see on YouTube, by the way. Her books, Neck Punch and Carry On and Blue, are available on Amazon and iTunes. Uh, her critically acclaimed sh uh, solo shows Rule Broad and This Broad's Way continue to play the crowds across the country, but not in COVID. And her debut live album, Rule Your Kingdom, is currently in stores and available on all digital platforms. Please welcome the girl with the last name after my heart, Leslie Margarita. <laughs> Andy, Andy, were you doing my pose? I was. I was doing all oh of God. your poses <laughs> and also just ogling at the picture of you and Bernadette because for once you were actually wearing something not scandalous. <laughs> I mean, and then there's so Bernadette what? just hanging out, which I just love. I mean, when you're. I... That was at the Broadway flea market and the, you have little name tags and I saw mine was next to hers and I flip <laughs> F out and she sat down and I, um, Chris Sieber, Christopher Sieber said I was catatonic. <laughs> I, I sat down and I was like, hi, Miss Peter. She goes, I know who you are. And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> and then 
Chris Sieber afterwards goes, well, her name tag's right there. <laughs> But you know, oh it, it's, my God. it's so funny as a Look performer, it, it's so funny as a performer meeting somebody of such, you know, like a diva, something we all grew up with. Like, what do you say? Because you want to come across cool and not weird, but you also want to say everything like I cried to you at prom night. You know what I mean? You want to like pour all this out and it's just not appropriate, but you want to. <laughs> well, I'm the I'm always the weirdest. And like Donna, Donna Murphy, I freak out over her all the time. And now I kind of know her. Yeah. And so even like when I went to see Hello Dolly and I went to see her, I'd be like, hi, Miss Murphy. She goes, Leslie, it's, 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 not, it's Donna. Like and I flip out, I flip out. Cheetah, I was, uh, oh, and Rita, and, uh, please, oh. all the Edas, I can. Okay. So I need the to Edas. hear how you guys met each other. Cause there's a story yeah. here. <laughs> You got it. This is on the rocks. Yeah, it, it's no, no, it's good. Uh, also, I just want to comment. It's really funny. Everybody's like their Instagram and mine's like www.playhouselive.org. But I have an Instagram, which is my cat. Oh, it's so. ridiculous, Andy, by the way. <laughs> I swear, Broadway people are the worst social media people. Except you, Leslie. Queen Leslie has got it going on. Queen but like Leslie. with Nicholas, okay. like Nicholas is like, I might have an Instagram. I don't know. <laughs> like, uh, come on. Oh, no, I'm all about it. No, I you are. It. Queen. In fact, there's Queen Leslie merch, by the way. I ordered my t-shirt today. Okay, so how, how, how okay, did you guys so, meet? So here's how we met. So this was probably 2004. 14. Probably, yes. Yeah. Let's age ourselves. In 14, I was doing two readings back to back with Leslie. But the greatest part was I never met Leslie. So I didn't actually know who Leslie was. And so I walk into the room. It's like the first day of music rehearsal. And I'm just like, I don't care. You know, and I, so I walk up to this girl who I <laughs> presume who I feel like I heard over over her introduce herself as Leslie. But she was probably just talking about Leslie, as people do. And so I walk up to her and I was like, I am so happy to meet you. And I am so excited that we are doing this and the next reading together. And you see the girl's face be like, we are? <laughs> and, then, and I believe that you were actually sitting right next to what? her. And you were. And just silent. You're, you're just like letting me fall all over myself. <laughs> and, then, and then when I quickly realized that this wasn't you, I turned to you and you, you put out your hand. You're like, Leslie. And I was like, <laughs> Andy. Andy. <laughs> so anytime we see each other or if I email her, I'll be like, Leslie, it's Andy. Yes, Andy. <laughs> you know, <laughs> So, so that's what's happened. I knew who you were, and I was so excited to work with you. And I literally was sitting there, and I'm, I, I'm always just, I don't know, the awkward girl in the room. And so I heard this happening, and I didn't want to be like, oh, maybe, maybe <laughs> I, I, he's, maybe Is I'm wrong. Me? Maybe I yeah. don't know. I, it was a whole thing. And this poor girl, though, thought she had another gig lined up. <laughs> I, was like, I, <laughs> I, was like, I didn't know it. <laughs> All right. Um, what I love. Let, to let me just say, yeah. Leslie Margarita is brilliant oh, in your brilliant. life. It is a transcendent performance. Yep. Well, and we Every have we have a little sneak peek. That, that screen we're... is just amazing. Well, Leslie's brilliant, um, and I know Leslie from Vicaya uh, Cruises. By the way, um, I probably don't remember that much, but you, you probably do. Anyway, okay. but what, what I love to ask performers uh, when they're together is, what did you learn most from each other? From just you, I like whether it's professionally, whether it's it's. Personally, what was the biggest thing that you learned from one another? Whoever wants to go first. Mm. Oh my God. Well, Andy, like, first of all, will be my friend for life. And that was, that's more important than anything is how like amazing his heart is and, and just how he cares about his performers. But that picture of us, by the way, says it all. Oh, I love it. Well, I love, like, I want to make this my Leslie. wallpaper. Like, yeah. Leslie. Yeah. <laughs> Leslie. But professionally, it's, just this like wealth of knowledge in a young person that's like unbelievable and you've worked with all these greats and so to pick your brain and just to say you know for me well no every performer is insecure so to go i don't know if i can pull off an iconic song like this and you'll pull up and you will pull up countless women who have performed the song and go look at this look how different they are Pick what you think. Take it, you know, take from Pearl Bailey. Take from you sent me Dorothy Loud in the other mm -hmm. day. Like, you know, it just like oh, is Dorothy. it's so amazing to get that kind of support. And that that just does not always happen at all. At all. Uh, so, for me, yeah. you know, I 
people like Leslie are the people that inspire me to keep doing this because oh, so she's sweet. old school, but she's also completely alive and present in whatever we're doing in every single moment. And, it, you know, for me, that kinetic energy that you find in performers that you want to work with is so important to the collaborative process. And not only is it about having a good time in the room and laughing and knowing that you can you can be silly and, you know, try on gowns by Oscar de la Rental. But, you know, <laughs> like, it's, it's, there's a certain essence of, of luck that I feel to get to work with people like Leslie, because I learned so much about phrasing and making music just by listening. Uh -huh. You know, if, if I would say my greatest education in life is working with people like Leslie or Barbara Cook or Audra because I learned so much just how to be present in the moment from people like her. This chemistry and adoration definitely comes through. Like that It's picture. horrifying, right? <laughs> <laughs> it makes me jealous. It's like, I want to do a happy hour with you guys. Um, <laughs> um, okay, Andy, I literally... I'm leaving you all. <laughs> you are leaving us all, but not before you play a little rapid fire. Are you ready? Oh, sure. Okay. What Jerry Herman song best represents your life? Mm, I don't want to know. Oh, okay. What musical do you think should be made into a film next? Doesn't have to be Jerry I'm Herman. Not giving, I'm not giving that away because it's a good <gasps> idea. <laughs> oh, okay. Stay tuned. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what musical note would you have given Barbara Streisand for the movie version of Hello, Dolly, since you've conducted the score? <laughs> Mm. Stop changing the key. Oh! <laughs> Did you tell that to Elena Roger too? Oh, anyway. Or Ricky oh. Martin. Uh, no, that's it. No, now we're done. Okay. Uh, uh, Andy, what is your guilty pleasure musical? That's like, oh, I know. It's not like raw, but I like it. Mm. Jekyll and Hyde. Oh, I love Jekyll and Hyde. Yes. Uh, I grew up in Houston. I saw every version of it. <laughs> well, yeah. Poor Houston. Uh, <laughs> what composer would you choose to now create a, a show? Since we've done Jerry Herman, who's who's next? Well, I'll give it away. Sheldon Harnick. <gasps> oh, my God. That's the apple Stay tree, tuned. too, right? Yeah. Ooh. I'm on a mission to really create content about writers that I think have not been given their sort of like extensive due. I mean, mm. we have spent so much time on Rodgers and Hammerstein, yeah. Sondheim, Lerner and Lowe. It, we have Cy Coleman, we have uh, Sheldon, uh, Cy you know, Coleman. Jerry and Sheldon. We have Jer uh, Jerry Herman, we have, uh, you know, Adler and Ross, like Charles Strauss. We need to give these people, we need to create content right now in this moment that we can preserve forever. And I'll especially now that you have the ear of, of the younger generation, like you said, like with your current cast, you know, it's they're attracting this younger generation that's hearing these songs and it's gonna start popping up in auditions now. It's gonna start popping up in cabarets and we're gonna we're gonna see revivals of, of these. It happened with the song Marianne that I did in this because you know Ryan plays it on guitar and it's dead drop dead sexy. But I had more people write to me. They were like, I don't know that song. I learned that song from Barbara Cook, okay? Barbara Cook sang it on a concert that was recorded. And she says, it's the greatest song that Jerry Herman ever wrote. And she sang it. And it, I remember falling in love with that song because the lyric is amazing. And then we did this version with him playing guitar here. And it's so sensual. But yeah. you hear that song and you're like, this is one of the greatest love songs ever written. I felt that for the Agnes Gooch song, I didn't know yeah. that song at all. I'm like, that is in my next cabaret. That's going to open my next cabaret. Hands down. Like, every gay man needs to just put that. You know, now we've heard Leslie do I Am What I Am. Like, now no gay man can sing that because it was <laughs> just yes. done perfectly. But now, with the Agnes Gooch song, it's these songs that we didn't <laughs> know. So, Andy, I was going to yeah. ask you to list your social media so we can find and follow you, but... <laughs> It's, it's Governor his cat. Giacomo 214. Okay, well, that's easy. Thanks, Andy, for that easy. But I want everybody to um, go, go to playhouselive.org um, and watch this beautiful Please. show. Andy, Love we're going to say goodnight to you because we have a lot. We, we, we're going to spill yeah. the tea with, with Miss Leslie here. Thank Please. you, Andy. Good night, Andy. I adore you all. Thank you. Bye. All right, Leslie, let's get right to it. Number one, I love your last name because number one, I love a pizza, obviously. But if you <gasps> but if you misspell your last name, it's my favorite drink too. 
Totally. I know. So I always say that. It's the pizza, not the drink, but either is fine. So I've seen you perform, and I was on Vicaya Cruise with you. You always remind me of like that bad girl in high school that you're going to smoke under the bleachers with, but who still gets the lead in every musical. Like that's exactly who who I think you are, like behind the scenes. Am I right? No, no. Do you know who I was? I was the homecoming queen, head cheerleader, like student body vice president, and still got the leads. And I was the I was Regina George, but nice. Like I literally. <laughs> I was I was the the good girl. Oh no, I never did anything bad in high school. Isn't that crazy? I know. I want some dirt on uh, Alexander on Vakaya Cruz. <laughs> So it was, it was the debut cruise. Kristen Chenoweth opened everything. Uh, Catherine McPhee was there. David Foster was performing. I think you're Alex I Newell. You yeah, and we did yeah. On the Rocks there. And there was Leslie in black, uh, I think latex kind of jumpsuit. Latex. Yeah, yeah, I clo- yeah, I closed the, the cruise. Yeah, down. and it was towards the end. So <laughs> by the end of the cruise, no, we were all friends and everybody had the time of their lives. And so, how do how do you how do you culminate all this amazing talent and amazing experience? The way you culminate it is in a Leslie Margarita show because it's not a cabaret. It's not. Um, it's it's such an experience. Like you feel like you're doing happy hour with you. We feel like we're smoking under the bleachers and being a little naughty. But at the same time, we hear this amazing voice that spans so many different genres. I, I could gush and gush, but I have like a million questions. Under the bleachers with Regina George. Yeah, well, oh, there, there you go. go. That's the name <laughs> of the next show. I love your journey in that you got to Broadway backwards. So right after totally. graduating UCLA, does uh, Fame LA, by the way, uh, which is, was that surreal filming that having been a theater student and your first real big TV gig yeah, was I mean, in fame LA? Yes, because, you know, I was at UCLA and thought I'll go to Broadway. Uh, yeah. you know, I really was at UCLA because I, I wanted to do the shows at Disneyland, which I did because I was, uh, uh, that's all I wanted to do was do shows at Disneyland. Esmeralda. Um, <laughs> right. Yeah. And, and then I started auditioning for TV shows and got this one, like yeah. right out the gate, wow. which never happens. And never. It never, you know, it doesn't, I thought it would be easy after that, but no. Yeah. Um, and it was just, it was crazy. And I had just been cast as a cover in the LA company of Rent. And I was going to cover Maureen and I was so excited. And yeah. then I got fame. And then I was like, well, career taken mm-hmm. care of. I'll, you know, get to do Broadway <laughs> after I do this TV show. No, no, it doesn't have to Because like, the TV show is just a giant bomb. But but <sighs> so, like, I, I loved it. And yeah. it was just crazy. Yeah, oh, insane. Because I wasn't cast as a singer-dancer either. Yeah. I was cast as a comedian. I mean, how crazy is that? Um, so is William Moses a hot daddy in real life? Oh, <laughs> he's, he's oh. like the sweetest man. Oh. Sweetest man. Oh, my gosh. Total hot daddy. So then not only did you not go just from TV to Broadway, you went to West End. Um, and not only did you, the Spitfire American show up and be like, oh, okay, I'm going to I'm gonna do a show in West End. Mm-hmm. Not as a supporting role, like not in the chorus. Originates a role, gets an Olivier Award. So sassy. What was the audition process for Zorro? Um, do you remember what you first auditioned with? Yeah, so it wasn't, so I didn't audition for the show. I auditioned for a one act version of a workshop oh. of Zorro the musical. And I remember being like, oh, that's a winner. <laughs> Zorro the musical. <laughs> and the audition was at, there's a studio. I'm, I'm in LA right now, the studio. Uh, yeah. So are we? In LA yeah. called Madeline Clark, which Yo. is like the, right? The I've gotten more rejections there, there than in West Hollywood. <laughs> I mean, you right? Sure? Because then there's also the happy quinceanera room where they have the quinceaneras <laughs> and like weddings and stuff. So and the I Persian birthdays. Don't forget the Persian yeah. birthdays. Yeah. Right. Oh, totally. So I was auditioning because a friend of mine called me. He was stage managing it. And I was like, oh, God, I'll go audition for Zorro for these British people. And I was auditioning for like the like Anjani Week girl. And I, I showed up and I was like, oh, this is not me. So I auditioned. Um, I I sang Bombaleo. They had me sing Bombaleo in the audition. And that, I ended up getting the role and from the ground up, like got to kind of write this role with with them for me, never thinking I would get to go to London. Always going, well, they'll get some Brit to do it. And it took three years of wow. workshops in 
California and New York yeah. and San Francisco, like three years. And then I was the one that they ended up taking, wow. which was crazy. The rest of the and cast was like, like really? <laughs> I, uh, uh, but I had been with it like the longest and, and, but it was, it was insane. It was so nuts. And I had been auditioning for Broadway shows and flying to New York for so many things yeah. and getting so close and nobody gave me a gig. And then I, so I ended up in uh, on the West end first, which is bizarre. And literally I was like, won the Olivier. Ooh, now I'm going to get a Broadway show. No. <laughs> <laughs> Where were you when you first heard that you had an Olivier nomination? Like who, who called you? Was it your agent or did uh, like, it's totally different there. Um, when I was nominated, it's now since changed, but when I was nominated and it was like baller, they had men and women in the same category for um, supporting. So uh, I was actually in my apartment there and there's no like campaigning for Olivier's. Yeah. It's just, the words are just not, not the same. Yeah. It's, it's cool. Like it, um, Well, and you're supposed to play it cool. Happen. Your acceptance speech was not playing it cool, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> so shocked because everybody there told me I wasn't going to win because they said Americans don't win. And, yeah. and now oh. some have, but then it wasn't, I, I was like, great. Everybody told me I wasn't going to win, including my, my dude that was Zorro. He's like, I, I was so excited to be nominated that I didn't even, I wrote down like a few names. My husband told me write down a few names in case. It, the, the speech is a debacle. I, look, I literally. And it's talk so about sweet, it, and it, no, it's 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 um it's it's very real. <laughs> Was it a Halle Berry moment? <laughs> well, no, they announced my name, and I and I always say like it looks like I was the next contestant on The Price Is Right. Like said my name you came on down. <laughs> like, it ran, like it is it just Kermit arms everything. It's unbelievable. Leslie, but it was very real. Yeah. Um, your resume really spans a few different times in, in Broadway. Not saying you're super old, by the way. I don't want this to end up in your next uh, debut album where you talk about like the backhanded compliments. No, I really mean that. But <laughs> you have been, uh, you know, you're, you've been in a few different genres, such as Matilda, such as Zorro, Dames at Sea. It's, it's really a culmination of what Broadway is. Uh, we've seen a focus on women in Hollywood behind the scenes, behind the camera. Uh, as directors, producers, writers, have you seen a change in women's roles behind the scenes in musical theater from your experience in the West End and in Broadway? Not enough. Um, not enough. C come, yes. Uh, I'm very, very lucky in that the roles that I play are always going to be the Spitfires or the the strong women or, you know, and, and the thing is, like, I play a lot of these classical roles, too, like Aldonza and yeah. even Adelaide in guys and dolls like these are really strong women so i'm very lucky that i get to play that kind of role um mrs wormwood uh, especially but um i definitely think there's been a shift in the last few years at least for workshops that i've done that is more uh from the female point of view and female creative team but it's definitely not enough um it's getting there it's it's getting there uh you know and i, I it's just going to take time. And the, the, the sure fact is there's just not that many uh, females behind the table hmm. because we haven't had that many opportunities. So a lot of women aren't going into the fields. You know what I mean? So um, I just think the more opportunities that women will will get, it'll just the field will just get bigger and bigger. But yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm seeing a shift. It's, it's coming. I hope after tomorrow that that completely changes. Well, yeah, the whole vision uh. of women in power. But it's very interesting that classic Hollywood has some great female roles, such as in Oklahoma, uh. Carousel, but it's still uh, a, a man's world in Broadway, which is so ironic. Yeah. You know, um, anyway, I have to talk about Matilda. 1,000 performances. Um, I hate children. I'm just going to be honest. I can't stand <laughs> children. Or cats. Oh, <laughs> Leslie, I'm going to ask you, how did you get through a thousand performances? What guy, either Xanax or Pina Grigio? Um, All of it. <laughs> but seriously, though, such a great role, such a great musical, but a thousand performances. And then kids on top of that. What wow. what kept it fresh for you? What, what kept you going yeah. back performance after performance? And then how well, did you keep the character fresh for, for you? So for me, I had tried to to make my Broadway debut for so long and yep. had gotten so close. And it took the Brits who had seen me in Zorro over there to give me this role. Um, so I was so 
overwhelmed and excited to be on Broadway finally after so long um, that I could have done 5,000 performances because wow. I was wow. so grateful to I be love that. on Broadway. Um, and I still feel that way. Like I, getting to do that is, is and I, I tell people all the time, I cannot stand there is a, a, a movement of people who are like, I'm tired, I'm gonna call out of my show. And and that has validity, validity sometimes, right. but I'm very old school in that I'm like, you do your shows. This is what I trained for. This is what I wanted my whole life. So one show, a thousand shows is no different to me. Um, I loved that role. I When I got it, people made fun of me because I don't like kids. I don't want them. <laughs> I, I, I love that you're just being honest. Yeah, they're, they're horrible um, creatures. Right? <laughs> I don't get it. Kids and but cats. Kids won me over because these kids were like not kids and, and Broadway kids have a different energy. It's mm. it's, it's unique different energy yep. and especially Matilda went out of their way to hire kids, not actor kids. There were mm. there were no parents, although the parents were lovely. The parents weren't around. We weren't allowed to talk to them about show business. Good. They didn't go out the stage door and sign autographs. Like Matilda did it right. The RSC does it correctly with those kids so i i loved those kids and it didn't change my mind about having them but <laughs> i i you know i'm a great auntie to these theater kids like i i love them that's enough but, um, and and the thing is like we had so many kids always changing rotating into the show so that's what kept it fresh honestly hmm. well and, and backstage you know the kids are in the kids room and you know you're kind of like an adult's room like probably smoking something uh <laughs> <laughs> Leslie, what I love no, about your no. voice, uh, which I really love about your debut album, Rule Your Kingdom, and you need to stream it on Amazon Music or download it, uh, recorded live, by the way, at 54 Below, yeah. um, your voice really does fit many different genres. Um, and we talked about Bette Midler and my favorite album that she did, which is Live from Cleveland, because it's so real and she sings so many different genres there. Um, singing the music of Jerry Herman is very classic um, what Andy said was so such a great uh, adjective was it's very clean music. Yeah. How did you mix uh, the style of Jerry Herman with your own uh, voice in terms of that you do have a you don't have that Broadway 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 like it's not right. that which I can't stand and I could name some performers that I'm like right. <laughs> no. You really have I, you a know, real voice. I'm, I'm I mean, kind of in the middle. I I I, I love the old. Judy Garland and the Belters like Ethel and I love those women and I don't have a traditional pop voice that now like an alphabet that you're expected to right. you know, riff and scrout like so high so I'm kind of in the middle um I grew up on country music uh so I and I like you were talking about music you listen to like I listen to pop music and Beastie Boys and stuff so I <laughs> I don't know. I'm, I'm I'm like right in the middle, but the Jerry Herman stuff was really difficult. Difficult because I had it in my head that these were iconic songs that I didn't want to mess up. Right. Mm. There's a lot of pressure. So it was there. more mental than anything. I, you know what was so great about what Andy did was he let us have our own take on it. So I didn't feel so much pressure to have to sing these songs like Barbara or like you know, because then it's 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 just a trap. Um, so I, I loved this kind of show and I had done a Sondheim show just like this for Andy as well. That was the same. It was put your own kind of voice on it. And I'm always telling people, it took me a really long time to like how I sounded mm, because mm -hmm. it wasn't normal and it yeah. wasn't what's kind of in, you know? So I think you have to look at these songs and, and really make them yourselves by telling the story and that and his stuff's so great because the lyrics are so great so they're really story songs that you can't riff <laughs> you can't like you I, know make too modern and and i love that you said that because you know all of your social media is, is queen leslie and you put it so great in in your debut album and in your one woman show it's not that you think you're better than everybody else but for myself i'm the queen of my own kingdom and i'm confident in what i have to offer and there is no broadway voice and you know the fact that you just said that is is just so great we're going to take a little peek at um at a pretty uh, well-known song, especially from the Jerry Herman uh, collection. Let's take a peek oh. at Leslie in Hello, Dolly. Oh. Hello, Harry. 
well. Hello, Louie. It's so nice to be back home where I belong. You're looking swell, Manny. I can tell, Danny. You're still glowing. You're still crowing. You're still going strong. We feel the room swaying for the band's playing one of my old favorite songs from way back when. So bridge that gap, fellas. Find me an empty lap, fellas. Tell me That is sex bomb. <laughs> One of my producers <laughs> just said sex bomb, which is so true. Uh, <laughs> how many days was uh, filming? Was it kind of done in a one-day shot? Was it a two-day shot? Three? Two. Two, two days. We rehearsed um, really, it was really quick. We rehearsed about a week, uh, you know, and I, I'm sure Nicholas will tell you because we kind of had the same experience. Andy, huh? um, Andy said like, don't worry about it. It's like three songs. It's mine. Oh, oh yeah. Oh. Okay, great. Number it's one, it's Hello people. Dolly, and uh, I am what I am. Yeah. And eighty other yeah. hits. No biggie. Yeah. <laughs> and so um, we had about a week to learn everything. We had a day, I think, of staging on the stage, but then we shot for two days, which wow. was which was nuts. And that's why what's so cool about this, and also what's so terrifying, is that it's live. Well, I just so, questioned my sexuality over here just for a moment ago. So <laughs> just letting you know, just. She hasn't had those comments Very before. Very briefly. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> Leslie, uh, no, it, it's, it's, it's frightening because it, it is all live and you only get a few shots and some numbers you got one take and that was it. Because mm. um, they were like, okay, that, yeah. that's fine. And so, you know, you spend the rest of the time in your dressing room like, oh <laughs> everyone's going to see me crack on this. It's just... <laughs> Like, and also like with the mask and it must have been as a performer, you know, when you finish a big show, we all love, there's the cast party, there's right. the audience, final curtain call. Literally after this, you couldn't even like really have a cast party. It's like, put your mask on and go home. It's like, and I guess we're done mm. after pouring my. Oh. We did. We, they got us a bottle of champagne and that's what we had in the dressing room after we were all done. We were like, okay, <laughs> bye. <laughs> That was it. It was so, so odd. Um, wow. And, and drink it from over because there. Because you were like, I was so excited to get to perform with these amazing people on a stage and actually like, you know, doing what we love to do again. And then it's over. So, uh, you know, that that just was kind of a bummer to have to go back to regular performing on Zoom. <laughs> now, <laughs> yes. Um, you had a real uh, moment on your on your social media um, that as a fellow performer, I just, it really affected me where you, your camera was still rolling and you had either just finished, oh. uh, um, an at home audition and you thought you had just done not so good. And it's these tears and it's this kind of raw and you're just, you're just kind of crying there and you still like, you shared it with us. It meant a lot to me, just oh. not even as a performer, but anybody going through COVID, we're not doing too well. You know what I mean? But That's it was right. such a real moment. And what I love about your social media, what I love about your storytelling, because I don't think you're like, oh, you're just a singer. You are a storyteller. And what, what I loved about you sharing that, it's like, yeah, this is the struggle of an actor. Just because I'm in this or I have an Olivier Award doesn't mean that it's smooth sailing. It's a daily, daily uh, struggle. And so I wanted to thank yeah. you for, for, for sharing that. Oh, no, I'm so glad it, you know, it, Everybody puts on their social media, oh, I got a oh, self tape yes. for this, and it makes everybody yes, look so exactly cool. But right. what you don't see is how many of these in this with this freaking blue background that you feel awful and you feel like the worst actor ever, and yeah. you're like, am I ever gonna get a gig again? And and it was just, you know, I think that's just more important to be honest about because it's so easy. Because I do the same thing. I flip through Instagram and I'm like, everybody's looking but me. And it's not true. We're just putting our best and foot forward. And as actors yeah, and performers, it. as you said before, we are inherently a bit insecure. You know, totally. we're well, always like, questioning ourselves. Look at me, ourselves, look at me. No matter how good we are. It's yeah. like, oh, yeah. God. Yeah. 
That, and there's nothing worse than putting on your social media like, you know, stay tuned, cats out of the bag, whatever. I just can't. <laughs> oh like, my god, I, those posts, I'm just like, meh, 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 meh. I mean, just, I, so when things like that happened, and it was just, I didn't realize my camera was on. I was having a breakdown to my friend. That it was, was so real. My, my best friend was reading the, the sides with me, and I. It's just one of those moments where you're like, oh, why am I doing this? I'm sending these out to the void. I'm terrible. It's you know, it's it was one of those things that I think it's important. If you're going to go in this business or if you're in this business. Well, and we heard your story. The Olivier Award was a three-year process for a workshop <laughs> of a project you thought, oh, God, okay, Zorro, okay. You know, we're going to play at <laughs> dinner theaters, you know, in oh, Calcutta. Sure. <laughs> I thought it was going to be like Party City, Zorro Mask. And just hey, like, I'm, all, hey yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm all about that. Anyway, um, so, Leslie, I want you to, to stick around because uh, we are bringing on Mr. Nicholas Christopher, a man so intense, he has two first names. Like, he just can't do, like, a regular name. He's like, Nicholas Christopher. Like, James Bond. Like, he's the James Bond of musical theater. So Look cool. At that. <laughs> he is a, a recent East Coast to West Coast transplant. He has appeared on Broadway in Hamilton, Miss Saigon, and Motown. Also, um, in revivals of The Tempest uh, for Shakespeare in the Park. Also, in Rent. On TV, you can see him on All Rise. I, I'm going to ask him about Anne Hage because she did the show two weeks ago. I wonder if they did any scenes together. Crazy. <laughs> also, FX's Sex, Drugs, and Rock and Roll. Uh, Nick received an Elliot Norton Award for his portrayal of Aaron Byrne Hamilton. Please welcome Nicholas Christopher. What's up, everybody? Hey. hey. So, Nicholas, number one, well, I'm going to ask you this later. Why is your social media so bad? Uh, except for uh, Instagram. <laughs> I'm like, can I tweet you? Can I Facebook you? It's like, just the gram. Nah, just just Instagram and tell you the truth, I'm a little sick of my own face. So no, I love your Instagram. It's I'm only... not sick of your face, and I he's straight. <laughs> Calm down. I, I don't. <laughs> but sorry, poor Pasadena Playhouse is trying to tag y'all, and it's like Queen Leslie, Queen Leslie, because she's got it under, and it's like wait, <laughs> hashtag who? Poor Andy. Anyway, <laughs> I I want uh, when I, uh, Leslie did this with Andy, and I'm going to do it with you. What did you guys learn from each other from this process? And now I understand it was under COVID, so you couldn't hang out like regular, you know, how we all have downtime during theater. We're all talking shit. We're all, you know, getting drunk and cast parties and all that. But what, during this limited rehearsal filming time, what did you learn from each other? I'll go first. Yeah. I had been a fan of Nick's and like I thought when I met him he was so serious and like he was an artiste and an actor and he is those things however we soon realized I was like he's a fool and I love him ah, like, I he's, love that. <laughs> he's one of those people that is so like he's so good at what he does that you just don't think you know those people that are so good at what they do you don't think they have like a personality as like, well Pat <laughs> No, no. Is that weird? Like, Patrick like Stewart is one of those actors. Yeah. Patrick was, Stewart like, is that so kind of actor. Good. And then he was like an amazing person on top of it. So for me, it was it made me feel better. I was like, oh my gosh, there are like amazing performers that are normal people. <laughs> <laughs> and listen, what I learned from him though, this was every single take. What I was talking about, like how nerve wracking it was to do in one take. This dude, every single take was perfect. On the top of a ladder, by the way, the whole time I was I'm, like, I know I that's on a ladder. I know it's on a ladder. It's unbelievable. <laughs> Nicholas, what did what did you right. learn from uh, Leslie? <laughs> oh, well, I mean, she started with her first impression. So my first impression was, I had always heard this name, Leslie Margarita, Leslie Margarita, mm -hmm. Leslie Margarita. And like, you know exactly who she is by hearing her name. And so we're in rehearsal and I think I had to be a rehearsal first before you or like you came late or something and you had like CVS bags. <laughs> <laughs> you had these, you had the mask on and these huge sunglasses. And then I turned around and within like two seconds, you had everything like spaced out around you on the floor because you were all six feet apart. And I looked and I, I turned around and said, oh, you're a wild woman. And that was like the first words to you ever. But the thing I learned about you, which was so like just great, is that, I, well, well, just part of your personality is like you're wild and crazy, but you have this depth about you that is just beautiful and you're not afraid to share that and I think a lot of people joke around and stuff as a cover and like you don't do that you bring both sides of your of all sides of yourself 
to everything. And so when we're filming these things or like when you would try something new or you might like mess up a lyric or two, like we all did, you were just like, great, let's go back to point A and let's keep moving and let's keep going. And um, the watching you be so fearless and not afraid to fail was just like, I think it got everybody else in the cast on the same page. Like, wow. oh, this is okay. We're, we're going to be okay. Uh, I love mm-hmm. that. They're amazing. Leslie, um, yes. Can you stick around because I want to I want to take a peek at one of uh, Nicholas's songs because I want to talk to you both about uh, this kind of gender swapping of title songs. Uh, Let's take a look at Nicholas Christopher. uh, If he walked into my life. Were the years a little fast? Was his world a little free? Was there too much of a crowd, all too lush and loud, and not enough of me? And I'll ask myself my whole life long, what went wrong along the way? Would I make the same mistake if he walked into my life today? So, you know, just a little ditty. <laughs> just the part where split spits flying out of my mouth. And... That means you're actually singing. You know how Jonathan Groff got so much crap for Hamilton because he's like, <laughs> it's like, that's a good singer, bitch. Um, so, Leslie, you sang I Am What I Am, which not only is gender swapping, but it's also an iconic song. It's like, okay, girl, what you got? Because like I said, it's done in every cabaret, every yeah. two hour first person's cabaret. It's like, oh, we're going to do this. Um, and I know that you had played with it a little bit during your debut live. You did like a little parody of it. You know, I am what I am. Cause oh, right. you were talking. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so then it's like, okay, we're going to do a Jerry Hume, uh, Herman celebration. Then we're going to film it. Then we're going to put it up on the internet and then we're going to promote it. And you have, I am what I am. And then Nicholas, uh, I think one of the most emotional songs from Mame, uh, if he walked into my life, we're going to give it to you. Um, how creatively, and both share experiences, when you knew that you were going to have that song, what, what was the first thing you did as an actor and as a singer? Like, what was your creative process to kind of, was it just learning the notes? Was it highlighting? Was it hearing the original recording? What was going on through your mind? And I know rehearsal process was like a week yeah, Barely. I, I put my pants wow. first. <laughs> and, <laughs> uh, I, I I was really nervous about I am what I am for so many reasons. Really nervous about it. Yeah. I went and looked um, up different female versions that Andy had had told me to look at, and then I realized that that was only going to mess with my head. So I put the kibosh on that pretty quickly and then just had to like look at those words and what they meant to me um but yeah that was that was a rough one to kind of be like oh oh why why me Mm -hmm. um but yeah I don't know I yeah to me it wasn't a a gender swap thing it was just like Mm -hmm. he writes such amazing words so yeah yeah for me luckily I was pretty and I hate to say this now, but I was pretty ignorant to a lot of Jerry Herman's work. Uh, I knew I am what I am as an anthem. I didn't yeah. really know it as like where it fell in the show or anything like that. And I definitely didn't know um, if he walked into my life. I had never heard it before. So then when I go to research these songs, cause I, I didn't know it, like <laughs> Angela Lansbury, yep. like we're just not, <laughs> comparable so and you're like was wasn't no- she in murder she wrote <laughs> yeah exactly. you should see her aaron burr <laughs> god i want to hang out with leslie so bad <laughs> but so like for me it wasn't really like 
there wasn't really any pressure. I had to find my way into the song. I didn't mm. understand the song mm. at all. And so Andy was really good about that, about giving me context for the song and the idea of regret and and looking back on your life and, and asking yourself, shoulda, coulda, wouldas. Like what, everybody can relate to that. Yeah, because so, isn't the, the human condition is the same for, for all of us, you know, at the core, you know? Absolutely. I, I will Absolutely. tell you what, what, I, what I took from that. Last week we talked with rapper Paige Kennedy and he talked about being a father in today's social and political climate. As a black actor is what he was talking about and with everything going on, that's all I heard during this song was, how do I take care of my kid? Now my kid is growing up. How do we exist? How do we have a family in today's day and age? Andy talked about this, is that the show is so timely, even though we think of Jerry Herman, it's like, oh, he does positive show tunes and we all love and adore. And Nicholas, I love the fact that you kind of approached it raw. It's like, okay, let's, we're going to learn this and we're going to you know, kind of do this. Um, but it really had a message. It's like, you know, looking back and how do we raise a family in today's mm -hmm. day and age? Nicholas, I want to know what personally uh, you brought to that song because it was obviously a very intimate moment for you. And any straight man who can cry while singing a show tune, I mean, I'm, I mean, Bachelorette, I mean, <laughs> Bachelorette, are you, are, are you listening? <laughs> no, like, yo, but I'm like the type of person that cries at commercials so it's oh, not really, same like my family saw that video and was like oh you crying again like <laughs> <laughs> i just have very active tears or something like it wasn't really like yeah but no the song is beautiful and the music just leads you there and the fact that you're coming in in the middle of a conversation like there's a lot of things going on right now that you know whether it's politically or, or privately, or just the fact of, of thinking about, you know, when I was doing Hamilton out here in LA and we had our final dress rehearsal and like hours before our first preview, we got shut down. And so for the past, since March, I've been thinking about the, you know, that last dress rehearsal yeah. that we had for the show. And I'm thinking about like, wow, did I, t I took that for granted. And there were moments in there that I was kind of just saying, well, this is a dress rehearsal. Let me either save myself for tomorrow or, you know, or just kind of taking mental notes, not really living in the moment. And, you know, that, and then finally to be able to perform on a stage and to perform a song like the, the first song I sing in it is called I Belong Here. Yeah. And just really to take all that in was very emotional. It was very, very emotional. Well, I'll tell you, getting emotional on camera, it's like, oh, are you crying again? It means so much on so many different levels. Number one, as a, a gay theater kid, to see a straight man enjoy an emotional role means a lot to me. Because it's, you know, this is the power of theater. It doesn't mean like, gay boys can only do theater. Like, it's it's more <laughs> than that. Um, yeah. Also, you know, it's just a straight man in 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 general. You know, I think we're learning that emotion is it's okay to have and it's great to express. Well, what you what you say that 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 comes from a place because I know when I was very young, being uh, even, even slightly effeminate or showing emotion was a slightly of, girl. He was doing marionette shows with his socks. Was this, uh, was was uh, I, I know for for my father who was filled with machismo, it was a sign of sort of weakness, right? So yeah, no, really, I'm I'm from Bermuda. Yeah. So that island life, it's like no emotion. And then after I moved, like I was seven years old when I moved to Boston. And like, you know, that Boston, Irish, Catholic, mm -hmm. tough. Yep. Like you, there's no, there is no uh, room for that. And in, uh, in school at least, or, or playing sports or anything. And, but I had like a really hands-on mom. Hmm. My, my sister and brother are both in the arts. And like- Your we, brother's an opera singer, right? Yeah, well, actually, he's in another cast of Hamilton too. He's, oh, he's I love that. What's his phone he's number? All... <laughs> his phone number <laughs> after the show. Okay, uh, but yeah, no, he's he's really amazing. He's in like in a bunch of like vocal competitions and stuff like that too. Um, yeah, so so we're we're an artsy family that you know, and then eventually my dad came around in the later years. You know, men seem to get more emotional as as they get older. And, That's uh, exactly right. Yeah. It's, it's really, it. and 
also another thing that you can pull from with uh, with if he walked into my life. Hmm. All right, Leslie, uh, we're going to let you go, but we're going to do a little rapid fire first. Oh, but uh, I got this question, by the way. Like I said, I saw you on My Vikaya Gay Cruise, which we love to have you there on our debut <laughs> cruise. We love, of course, gays love you. Big hair, big voice, big, <clears throat> yes. Talent. Talent. Yeah. God, yeah. Nicholas is so good. He's so good. What is your message to your gay fans in regards to the future of this nation? Tomorrow's a new day. Oh, just relief and and the the go forward with no fear. Hmm. No, I just you know I I still think like be we we have a lot of work to do. <laughs> be careful, but. Oh my gosh, I'm just I just feel like tomorrow everyone's just going to go <gasps> mm. and breathe. Everyone, everyone, mm. gay, mm -hmm. straight, well, not everyone, but <laughs> who half cares? Of us yeah. will. <laughs> More than half popular vote. <laughs> um More than half, yeah. Leslie, are you ready to play a little rapid fire? Sure. Worst on stage mishap. Oh, well, there's two. <laughs> the worst one though, um was in the West End. I my spoiler alert, my character dies a very sad death and I'm laying center stage dead and a giant rat <gasps> Oh my god, a broad body, no joke. Ran across my body. Oh and, my god. And <gasps> no way. had a bunch of flamenco dancers, so all I heard lying dead was raton, raton, raton. <laughs> like, dead rat runs across and I was like <gasps> Oh my god! And then died again. <laughs> oh my god! Oh my god! And then Matilda, I do like a cooter slam in my yeah. number, and I got a piece of stage in my leg. Oh my Ooh. god! Finish the number. <laughs> That's Leslie Margarita, by the way. Yes. Uh, men's leading role in a Broadway show that you would love to play. It could be classic, contemporary. Uh, just no, I'm and I'm dying. I want to be the first woman to play King George in Hamilton. <sighs> Oh, da, 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 da. Miss Piggy does it. And just Can we hear world. a little bit, maybe? No. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, <laughs> have I you... really, really, really want to do it. Okay. Least favorite song you've had to perform? You're like, oh, okay, oh, I'll sing it. The list. The list is so long. <laughs> maybe oh, one oh, you won't this... get fired over. No, no, there's too many. I don't know. Uh, there's too many. <laughs> Come on, Leslie, just one. Least favorite? Yeah, you're just like... You want me to sing that? Fine. Oh, I don't know. I don't know. Oh, this is too rapid. Go to the next one. I'll, I'll sing. That's, uh, that's what I was an audition song that should just retire that you never want to hear again. <sighs> These are hard. <laughs> <laughs> it's because you're PC. Um, you're like. Mm. Oh, I coach a lot of uh, kids, like high school and college. And like every girl who wants to be quirky sings, pulled in a new direction from uh, Adam's family. And yeah. Um, okay. Anything from, from Wicked, go away. Yeah. Yeah. You know yeah. What I hate. You know what I hate is every like young gay boy. You hear like dun 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 dun, and then he'll start to cry and be like, something has changed yeah. within me. And I'm like, I can't, I can't. So. <laughs> No more gay boys doing Defying Gravity. Hey, I, I agree. Um, it's like you're already floating. You're not Defying Gravity. All right. I mean, let's, we get it. We get it. Leslie, West Side Story movie, excited or perplexed? Well, a really good friend of mine is Anita, Ari um, oh. DeBose. Uh, I, honestly, like, uh, I don't see a need for it. But if it's great, then yay. I'm kind of a fan of everything. Like, I'm not a great critic. Um, so... I hope it's successful. Um, I lovely, I, I love you, Leslie Margarita. Leslie, tell everybody where they can find and follow you and buy your merch, by the way. Merch? Yes. Uh, Queen, Queen Leslie everywhere. Twitter, Queen Instagram. Leslie. And it's L-E-S-L-I. -E and it just stopped because that's enough. No E. My mom did that. So, you know, the stripper <laughs> spelling, Leslie. Um. <laughs> I love you, Leslie. Why? Love, love. Let's go on a gay cruise again, please. Oh, we will. And also, when COVID's over, can we have a drink at the Abbey and then you'll really tell me what's going on? Yes. Done. Done yeah. and done. And I'll really tell you the, the tea. Yeah. Thank you, Leslie. Bye. 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 Bye, -bye. <laughs> Playhouselive.org. Um, she, she's amazing. Nicholas Christopher. 
Yo. You get accepted to Juilliard, and then a year in, you're like, okay, thanks. I'm going to go work for real now. This is such a quandary with so many professional students is like, do you just stick with what you know, or do you take a chance and do something different? You went to work with In the Heights, which we know turned into a lot more. Yes. Can you go back yes. to that but, point where you kind of had to make that decision and what was the determining factor? Well, anxiety and stress, first of all. <laughs> so thank you for bringing me back to that point. Um, <laughs> They're great motivators. <laughs> they yeah, are, actually. So I was they in, test you. I was, two, I was two weeks into my second year at Juilliard um, when I got the part. And my favorite acting teacher who like turned my life upside down looked me in my <laughs> eye on a bench in Central Park and say, you are making a grave mistake. Wow. And, you know, I just had to chalk it up. Everybody has their own paths. And, you know, it was like, I knew, I wouldn't have just left for any part, like to be, you know, to understudy Simba in whatever, right. you know, tour or something like that. That would have been fine if I was out of school, but like, I wouldn't have left school for that. Uh, within the Heights, it was always, I mean, it was a show that gave me permission to be able to do theater and and, not, and be myself within theater. Mm. Um, not have to put on a voice or a certain walk or mm. anything. Like I could truly be myself on stage. And not only that, but I got to do it in Puerto Rico with Lynn at yeah. 20 years old. So I have... I had my first audition for In the Heights when I was 19 and I booked it when wow. I was 20. And there was, I just couldn't pass that up. And um, they gave me the option of coming back to school, which normally they don't do, but uh, they gave me an option of coming back if I didn't, yeah. So, but then I ended up booking rent and then everything was just kind of off to the races after that. Mm -hmm. So I definitely always have that question in my mind. What if I had stayed? Uh, but, you know, I got the, I got the groundwork there to continue to learn and grow. You were kind of the poster child along with Lynn Manuel of the future of Broadway. We know Jonathan Larson changed everything with rent, which you happen to do the revival, which I think is so, um, you know, it's so kismet that you did that revival, but you're also part of this new wave of Broadway. Something we've never seen. If somebody would have asked me to invest $20 into Hamilton, I would have been like, are you crazy? Like, no. There's this new wave of Broadway, um, and it's affecting everything. It's it's more mainstream. Broadway has become mainstream. Um, let's talk about taking over the role of George Washington in Hamilton. You know? Yeah. What an amazing opportunity, but also at the same time, everybody knew the album backwards and forwards and backwards and forwards. How did you want to make the role your own so that the minute you took stage, we're like, oh, it's it's Nicholas is 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 here. Yeah, I mean, I think I was like I was one of the youngest people. I mean, especially at that time, I'm yeah. old, I was like, what, 25 and Chris Jackson, obviously, has been around for a while. So. I knew that I, I had to um, bring gravity that, that I hadn't really experienced before to the stage. Mm. And that was the biggest challenge was I didn't want it to look like a 25 year old, you know, next to Javier uh, <laughs> and just like have it not make sense. So I, I, it was, it was, it was, a, it was a lot and it was big shoes to fill with Chris Jackson because, yeah. you know, Chris is just a big presence and he's a big personality and, um, you know, he's been an idol of mine for a while. So it was, it was interesting because I also did the readings of Hamilton. So I, I saw it transform from five songs to then like four hours and 15 minutes to then the like well-crafted, epic show that it is now. And I played almost wow. every male role yep. except for George Washington, because it was always Chris. Isn't that crazy? Um, yeah, it was, it's really weird. So it was it was a new experience. It was, it's, it, I don't even, I don't know how, but I had a lot of guidance and I had great, uh, you know, I had a, a great mentor in Chris. We're gonna get a little fun right now. Uh-oh. Nope. 
there uh, we've interviewed so many theater people that have had horrible experiences of dating fellow cast members. <clears throat> well, we know it kind of has worked for you, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, Nicholas is going to be married. Aww. I look at the way his face just lit up. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so beautiful. Uh, you guys met during Hamilton? No. We met 10 years ago during In the Heights. Oh. 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 And she... She was on Broadway. I was on the tour and I saw her backstage and, and then I saw her dance on stage and I was like, who is this person? And so now anytime I need to make her feel guilty, I have our <laughs> Facebook messages where it's just me. Hey, how you doing? What, what's going on? How you doing? What's happening? And no she didn't response? answer? Oh no, Pardon? Nicholas. That's uh, creeper level. For years. And I was just like... <laughs> Aimless. You're giving hope yeah. to a lot of creepers out there, by the way. Oh, <laughs> and there was no restraining order. <laughs> yeah, for real. <laughs> yeah. So then we went out. We went out on like two dates um, in 2015 when I was out here visiting LA. Nothing came of it. I later found out that she didn't even think they were dates. Um, oh my god. And, yeah, and so then, then the I'm only straight man in theater, and she's like, mm, I "Are don't you know that sure you're getting married?" <laughs> <laughs> well, I asked her on Facebook chat. <laughs> yeah. No, your your uh, your pictures together are 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 just stunning. Oh. She's really awesome. She's really wonderful. Like, and I went through a weird time. Like, my grandmother passed away on tour and stuff, and I had just gone through a different breakup uh, beforehand. And she was just, we became best friends. And this like partnership that we had on tour and this like, you know, it was just, uh, it just developed into something because I, at that, by that point, I didn't think I ever had a chance. So we were able to just really form a great friendship and then she will, she doesn't leave me alone now. So we're good. <laughs> what are the do's and don'ts of dating somebody in the industry? Why are you putting up that creepy ass picture of me? <laughs> oh, I love no, I think it's so dramatic. It's like, yes, I'm in Hamilton and here's yes. no, but here's the reality of behind the scenes too. Yeah. Like this is the no, frenetic really. energy behind the scenes. Yeah. Well, I learned I learned to do it the right way with Jen by doing it the wrong way a bunch of times. Oh, there she is. Um <laughs> so it's about, you know, we both are so very serious about our work. We're both very serious about our craft. And so when we were at work, we were at work and, you know, we would, we would share looks on stage every once in a while. And we had our <laughs> moments where, you know, we, we might linger a little bit too long, but it never got in the way of the storytelling. That's mm -hmm. what I love so much about Jenna. She's such a phenomenal storyteller. She's like my, she's my acting coach now. So anytime I have an audition or anything, I just pass her the sides. I'm like, well, so, so what do you think about this? And she'll be um, honest too. Oh, completely and we get into like little arguments about like when she tells me i'm bad and like she does i'm bad she's like well maybe you could work on this she's too sweet to tell maybe you can make a another choice oh. Oh. are you there yeah 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 are you still there yeah oh okay my thing cut out um so yeah uh she's just uh she's amazing she's amazing actually i might need her to bring the charger for the ipad right now sorry jen Oh, it needs to happen now because I have some good questions. Oh, okay, good. Jen, can you bring me the charger, babe? Come on, Jen. <laughs> we're getting a cameo. <laughs> Nicholas, so we know we're going to see you on All Rise, CBS. Did you have any scenes with Anne Hage? No, I didn't. <laughs> oh. I think they wrote me out of the show. So oh. I did, like, I, felt, I was feeling good last year. Last year, January, I was feeling good. Great. Well, I saw you in your suit um, on set. Like it was all. Yeah, I was yeah. feeling good. Yeah. I was like, oh, I just moved to New York. This is my first uh, LA. I, this is my first audition in LA, and I booked it. So I was like, I'm gonna book this TV show. I'm about to do Hamilton. Oh. I just got engaged. We're in this nice house right by the Pantages, and like I was really feeling myself. And so by the time March came, it was like a very yeah. good yeah. ego check. Like, listen, you <laughs> you better sit down and realize what you have. I'm just plugging this in. Yeah. I'm sorry. I'm no, no. Done. Nicholas, did you like filming theater in um, UI Like? Oh, yeah. What did you like about what what did I you like... like about it? What did you not like about it? This is so funny. <laughs> What's that about? <laughs> this view is well, just hilarious. Yo, I'm so sorry. How unprofessional. 
Give me two seconds. Okay. Okay, we're making it. All right. So, um, yeah, what did I like about filming theater? Filming yeah, yeah. theater was great because a lot of times when you sing these songs, you have to be a little bit more larger than life, and this you could really make it intimate, where um, you don't have to feel the proscenium arch hmm. to, so the back row can see you, but instead your face becomes a proscenium arch. Hmm. And if you just look like this, it tells a whole different story. And so playing with that was a little bit intimidating, but it was also uh, an interesting puzzle to, oh. to, to fix. Like, I, I mean, I was really nervous for um, mascara because there's a lot of words and everything and I wanted to do it justice. Yeah. And where they have this tight shot of just my face. I'm like, I hope I don't have a lazy eye. I hope I don't have <laughs> my nose. Eye. My eyebrows, I got thick eyebrows. I hope they're not going all over the place. I'm so jealous so, of your eyebrows. It was great. It was great. It was, uh, it was an interesting challenge, most definitely. But I mean, but, but without the the audience, I just I, I just can't because you rely on the audience for a lot of for energy. And while I'm not a, a musical theater guy, I have done musical theater, but I more you know I do plays and stuff. So not yeah. having an audience there to feed, you know, seems like a, another cha a challenge upon itself. Definitely, but you got to be you got to. The audience is tricky sometimes too. Mm. This is a much more controlled environment, mm. right? So when you have an audience, it can feed you, but then all of a sudden you start feeling the audience and mm. then all of a sudden you start feeling the audience. Am I still here? Yes. Um, and then like, then you start giving a little too much and it actually takes away from the uh. story. And uh, with, yeah and then the same if the audience is dead then does your performance become dead too so it was just really cool it was oh, a yeah. controlled and where we felt safe nicholas we're uh, oh we have a little cute <laughs> picture look look at that so his, his post is you know i make fun of his social media but on instagram his instagram is great um so he was casting peter pan not as a lost boy as as a crocodile <laughs> and he almost wanted to quit is that true Absolutely. <laughs> I, I'm still mad about it. Oh my I'm, God. Still, I'm furious about it. The director's name was Steve Flynn. Uh, Let's call him. Steve Flynn in, in Massachusetts, who everybody else, all my theater friends, my age were all lost boys. And because, I don't know, the, during the audition, they were like, can you crawl on the floor? And I was like, yeah. And I crawled across the floor and they were like, great, you're the crocodile. <laughs> <laughs> Hot ass suit that weighed a thousand pounds and not get to be in any of the fun numbers with my friends, but I got to sweat and just crawl across the stage. Yeah, the Lost Boys do have some fun uh, chorus. So Nicholas, I, I want I want your honest opinion here on the show. We you know we get a little tipsy and we get very candid. Uh, yes. We're truly entering a new age of diversity in musical theater. Of course, before COVID, but I think after COVID, we've had all this pent up energy. We've had BLM, BLM. We've had a change of administration. When COVID ends, I think theater is going to be like, it's going to be an explosion of the angst that we've been feeling. Um, but there is some pushback saying it can go too far, such as like, oh, is an Asian Evita or a female Sweeney Todd around the corner? What is your take on the focus on diversity? And should we kind of uh, keep in mind the original ideas for roles or what's your take on that? Um, I don't know. I want to see uh, anyway. All right. Yeah. I'll answer your question. Um, it depends on what story they want to tell. Mm. And, oh. you know, we, it would be a lie if skin color didn't, if we said skin color didn't matter. Um, you know, it's definitely a, a, of statement when I walk out on stage as George Washington and you yep. see a black George Washington with yep. a bald head and a beard like that you know that is definitely a choice and that's the story that the creators of Hamilton want to tell and want to show and uh I think it's up to whoever is telling the story to do it as authentically and as detailed as possible now in terms of diversity I mean, I got to tell you, I'm not as optimistic as all the uh, other people are. Um, you know, the, like, until we see more producers of color, more theater owners of color, uh, 
and genders like it's like it's it's nothing's really going to change it's going to be kind of bad and then it's going to fizzle out and go back to the to to the way it was and to mm. the way it is which is a you know i i've said this so many times you know it's like a hot topic and it's the cool thing to do and we talked to Leslie about women behind the scenes and she's like, you know, it's still kind of a man's world. And that is a great point. It's like, we need to see people of color behind the scenes. You know, we yeah. know uh, Lynn manuel has done amazing things, but he's one person with one genre that, that he does. I think that's a great point. Is, But I think performers like Not you, oh, I, I think performers like you are inspiring other performers to not just be uh, playing roles, but to produce, direct, and tell their own story. Absolutely, absolutely, and it's so important. And you know, they they talk about like you know, oh, the pipeline, the pipeline, the pipeline. But you know, you can't go to uh, New York and intern at a casting uh, office un unless you can have your parents pay for it, or or yeah, you know, exactly come right. from means. So there has to be other ways to find talent out there because the talent is out there mm. and they're just not getting the exposure or the opportunities uh as well as black producers there are amazing black producers out there that want to tell interesting stories that are very qualified but you know when they sit down across the table from a theater owner is a theater owner gonna go with the black producer who hasn't produced anything on broadway yet or are they gonna go with scott rooting or go yeah. with somebody who's reproducing Annie or, or you know, the, a the, safe the bet or thing. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, it's, it's interesting. Nicholas, you have to come back on the show because I'm going to ask you about the dichotomy of Hamilton being so diverse, but then tickets are $350 and yeah. who's able to see that. That's a whole other show. Yes. And now you're in well, LA. Yeah, it's but... very easy for you to come in and talk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm in LA. I'm chilling. I got, you know. And Leslie's schedule. chilling. We're, yeah, we're, we're all just going to. I'm chilling. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, Nicholas, who was singing at your wedding, by the way? Can I please come to the reception? Because I know you're going to have all of the hot Broadway chorus boys, which I have a, uh, <laughs> I have a thing for. Yeah. So, I mean, we're definitely having um, uh, Ryan Shaw. Do you know who Ryan Shaw is? He played Stevie Wonder in Motown. Oh. And he, it, look him up. He's Grammy nominated, nominated, my favorite singer in the entire world. Uh, definitely going to be Morgan James is going to be in there. Uh, Amber Iman, my brother, my sister, we're going to make her sing. Uh, Wilkie Ferguson, we're going to have, it's going to be, I, what I want, what I envision is just going to be a live kick-ass band who, whatever, whoever wants to grab the mic uh -huh. and hop up and sing a song is going to grab, grab the mic and sing a song. I love that. Am I invited? I, I just have to be in, in, invited. Yeah, you got the liquor. He's like, well, he's still his fiance. Remember, no. <laughs> Nicholas, are you ready to play a little rapid fire? Yes. So we talked I'm about gender swapping. Leading female role in musical theater you would love to play. I'd love to play, you know, I gotta go go for it. Like, I'd love to play Alphaba. Absolutely. Oh, wow. That's yeah. Yeah. Uh, biggest shady thing you've seen happen backstage between actors, and you've done road, and you've done Broadway, so you've been in many different experiences. Yeah, I won't tell you what show, but there was an actor who was yelling at uh, a sound person backstage because they came in. Anyway, they were having a messy show because they had a good time the night before, oh. and they were yelling at a sound person because they couldn't hear, and I had to put a stop to that because that was not good man. Yeah. Person's fault. I think that would be me, by the way. Um, what <laughs> show tune best fits your personality? Excuse me? What show tune best fits your personality? Fits my personality. I don't know. It depends. Sometimes I'm Sweeney Todd. Sometimes I'm uh, the star to beat. <laughs> ah, yeah. Okay. Uh, least favorite thing you had to do in Miss Saigon, whether it was backstage or on stage. Least favorite thing? Yeah, you're like. Eh, okay. I, had a, I had a leak in my dressing room that was causing mold, and they kept oh. telling us that there was no mold, but there was mold spots growing on my ceiling. So sitting in my dressing room during Miss Saigon was the worst. And they're like, "What is that?" And you're like, "They're called Bedoy." 
<laughs> so stupid. Uh, what musical would you make into a film if you were a producer? Not starring in, but like as a producer. What film do you think would be really popular? Um, I would love to see... <sighs> I mean, Ragtime's my favorite musical. I think and that would be we just awesome. celebrated the anniversary, by the way, which yeah. it, everything is happening. You know, like the Jerry Herman, the themes in that, and the fact that we're celebrating Ragtime's anniversary. Mm. It means so yeah. much, especially and rent, tomorrow. And Rent 25th anniversary. That's, so, that, that's, that's right. right. Yeah. yeah. Nicholas, uh, where can people is find that the and. Rapid Fire? Yo, oh, yeah. Oh, that was great. <laughs> where can people find and follow you uh you can find me at my instagram account uh nikriz n-i-k-r-i-z yeah spell that uh, because i trying to tag yeah. you and poor pasadena playhouse is trying to tag all their cast members so I'm like ugh, forget it just hashtag I, uh, yeah just hashtag nick chris um so yeah n-i-k-r-i-z find me on that's the one that I'm kind of the most on. No, uh, it's great. There's behind the scenes photos and photos of your engagement and everything. It's wonderful. My beautiful lady. Yo, thanks for having me. And I would love to come back. And I I'll, would I'll love to come sip on. What are you sipping on there? Oh, um, just a little vodka. Just, just a touch. <laughs> just a right. tad. Sipping. <laughs> yeah. No, but honestly, uh, Theater is alive and well in Los Angeles and digitally. So, Nicholas, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you for having me. It really, really means a lot. And I love that you guys do this because, you know, you give a voice to so many and give such an interesting perspective on everything. You have fun while you're doing it. Yeah. I mean, it's perfect. Playhouselive.org. And you can watch You I Like. And Nicholas just, he just mops the floor with it. He's so great. Thank you, Nicholas. Thank you. <laughs> Bye, y'all. We are way over time, so real fast, Michael. What? A role you could probably get cast in that you would that you wouldn't be that excited to play. You'd be like, meh. Uh, uh, La Casa Fault. Oh yeah. Oh sorry. Yeah. sorry, sorry. Hello Dolly, Bette Midler or Bernadette Peters? Oh Bernadette. Female lead you would love to play. F f female lead? Uh yeah, on, on, on Broadway? Yeah, musical theater. Evita. Don't we all? But I wouldn't sound like that. <laughs> Where can people find and follow you? Uh, Michael Vega Act. At those things. At Michael Vega Act. Michael Vega. That, yeah. <laughs> You'll find it. All right. Uh, that's all, folks. Thank you so much. It's a grab bag of fun every week on, on the Rocks. Next week, we chat with actor Michael uh, Yuri, by the way. It's going to be uh, an intense talk. A big thank you to our fabulous guest, my engineer, Kurt. Kurt, we ran over. I'm so sorry. He has to run home and role play Harry Potter with his wife. Our intern, Alexis Mendez, and my associate producer and special guest co-host, Michael Vega, and my researcher, Mama Rose. P.S. It's my mom. Hi, Mom. Uh, and you are fabulous audience. Honestly, we love you. And you know, every week it's so different. I uh, hate long goodbyes. Stay happy. Stay healthy. Stay sexy. <laughs> This has been another episode of On The Rocks. Tweet me and slide into my DMs on Twitter and Instagram at On The Rocks On Air. Find everything On The Rocks for free at ontherocksradioshow.com. Subscribe, like, review, and share. Until next week, stay fabulous.